Hi everyone, hey, thanks so much for joining me today. I know the Christmas season can be such a wonderful, joyful time, but I know it can also be a, a hard time, a painful time. And when I say painful, I don't necessarily mean physical, though some of you may be going through some physical difficulties or you know, fighting a sickness. But the truth is, is that when I say it's painful, it's usually something in our relationships. Maybe we've lost a loved one. I know that's the case for our family. Maybe it's a, a, a rift that you have in your family or with friends or even at work, and it just makes the holiday season difficult. Well, that's why this series that we're starting today is so important, and it's called Christmas is Forgiving. I know we oftentimes associate Christmas with giving of gifts, but how about the giving of the gift of forgiveness? And so the next few weeks, we're going to talk about that. And today we started with part one on the gift of forgiving. We're about to see, and maybe some of you already have seen, some, some people that cause kind of some tension in your life, you know? So uh, speaking of tension, how many of you um, have got your Christmas shopping done? Anybody? Oh, I, seriously? I, I, you know what? Of all the people in this group, I would have guessed, yeah. Uh, anybody not started yet? Yes, thank you. I see those hands. God bless you, you know. Um, I am one of those strange guys, and I'll admit it right up, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to lose man, man points on this one. Uh, I really am. But um, I don't mind shopping. I, I really don't. I never have uh, really minded uh, going shopping. So yeah, um, but what is a very difficult task for me, extremely difficult task, is picking out gifts. Um, I, I have, you know, my tendency is to buy you know, 10 presents for someone instead of just one. Picking that one gift, I'm terrible at it. Now, my wife and my daughters are phenomenal. They, they, are, they have really honed that skill of finding, uh, you know, strategically picking out gifts. But um, those of you who know me best, um, and you would never guess this about me, but um, I overthink everything. Okay, some of you do know me really well. I second guess everything. And that makes me way too indecisive in, in a lot of areas of my life. So today we're going to look about, we're going to talk about, about giving a gift that's really much, much harder than trying to decide that perfect gift for that person, for that family member, that friend. Um, we're going to talk about forgiving. Um, we're gonna, today we're going to begin this series called Christmas is Forgiving. And today we're going to begin our series talking about forgiving the people who have hurt us. Um, those difficult times. And, and you're going to see some of them. Some of them maybe you even work with. Some of them you see on a daily basis. Some though are coming into town and you're going to have to, you know, deal with this. But um, I hope that this will help you not just at Christmas time, but it's going to help you throughout the whole year. Um, Christmas is a time to forgive. Um, throughout the Christmas season, the world is rejoicing that the Savior came, that Jesus came, the greatest gift to all of mankind came, and that, you know, the Son of God, God in the flesh, whose, you know, work on the cross and, the, and rising from the dead, I mean, redeems us from our sinful condition. He came, Jesus is, you know, we say Jesus is the reason for the season. His forgiveness, his salvation is what we celebrate. And our greatest gift to one another is not going to be found in some nice, brightly, uh, wrapped package or even something parked on the driveway. I don't know, just throwing it out there. <laughs> but in offering that gift of forgiveness, that extending grace to, to them, just as, as Christ came and extended his grace to us. And so uh, I think we could say we're officially, whether, you know, some people kind of push the season. You know, when it gets to be December, we can, and, you know, Thanksgiving's over, we can kind of officially say, okay, we're in the Christmas season, right? Um, I loved, I loved, uh, I loved uh, Christmas as a kid, but I love watching kids uh, with, in Christmas. It's really fun. I, I loved it. Um, in fact, I, I probably say this every year. Those of you who have been here a number of years, I probably say this every year, but I am such a summer person that Christmas is the one thing that redeems winter for me. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, so after the first of the year, um, that's when it gets a little rough there. But uh, anyway, but... It's one of those things that, um, as a kid, I loved, I loved Christmas. My parents made it a lot of fun, and it was, it was really, it was great. But, um, but I had no idea how much more fun Christmas time is when you have kids. I mean, it was a blast. I mean, I, th I always had a great time as a kid, but watching my kids and their excitement and the fun and doing all the fun things, the celebrating and the eating all the bad stuff, you know, all that kind of stuff. Well, then... Some of you will be able to, you know, you know, really identify with this. But then you have grandkids. 
whole nother level. I mean, it's just really, really pretty amazing. And so I've always loved that. But, you know, kids can't wait. It's, it's all great. I mention that because, you know, those of us sitting here uh, have experienced some life. We've had a bit of a journey. We've been around. It's, it's not like, hey, I'm six years old and I'm rushing down to see what, uh, you know, what gifts are under the tree. Um, we've gone through some difficult times. Unfortunately, life sometimes gives us what we really don't want. Um, oftentimes experience the pain that real life can deal us. And for some, Christmas may have gone from a, a really wonderful highlighting time of the year to being a very difficult time. Um, I have already heard people say, I just tolerate the holidays. Already heard it. Um, you know, I've heard people say, I, 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 just, I just try, I just hope I can survive the holidays. And I get that. We take our already busy schedules and we jam them with other activities, some which is fun, some which is, you know, kind of laborsome. But then we have to address how unwanted pain can sometimes get introduced to any time of year, but especially during Christmas time. In the middle of Christmas, for example, um, I, I'm friends with enough people that I know of people who a divorce or two has hit the family. Um, and, you know, during Christmas time, I mean, it's horrible anytime. Those of you who experience that, you know, it, it doesn't matter what time of year, it's horrible. But then add that to a holiday dynamic and it's really, really tough. Uh, a gal that I'm friends with at the gym, um, she um, was really anticipating that this Christmas would be a time where she was going to get engaged. It was, oh, it was really exciting. And, um, but then right before Thanksgiving, her boyfriend of eight, I said eight years, decided, eh, I don't know what I want to go. She, I mean, she was just crushed. And then her brother, her brother, one year, they've been married one year, but wife, surprise, surprise, I'm divorcing you, you know? And she said, she goes, this holiday season's going to be a whole different deal. It's going to feel much different than all of the others. Some of you have experienced that, and you can look back at that. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's all of that pain, you know, all of, all of a sudden you've got this logistical pain too. Those of you who um, have experienced divorce and you've got kids involved, then it's rushing back and forth and trying to get everything, you know, back and forth to different houses in a 24 hour period perhaps, or, you know, or it just feels like you're being ripped off. It's kind of like you got Christmas Eve last year and then you're getting to spend more time than I am with them. And then you bring new people into the family, right? Some, some, you know, the new people dating other people or friends or whatever. And you say, well, you know, I haven't had really had a chance to warm up to them or get to know them a little bit. I'm not really not sure how I feel about all of this. And so, and there's just a lot of questions, a lot of heartache, and there can be a lot of even bitterness. Another thing that can really mess with, you know, the celebration time is when someone dies an untimely death, an unex well, expected or unexpected. It just makes it so difficult. And suddenly you're, you're facing a Christmas where last year your table was full and now there's an empty chair. We're experiencing that with our family. This is the first Christmas holidays, all of these that um, without my father-in-law. And he was a highlight of our whole Christmas season because he's so funny and fun. And, uh, and so we're really, we're feeling, we're, we're feeling that. And some of you know that feeling. Somebody you deeply wish was there. Someone who it's just, it's not going to be the same without them is missing. But then also, you know, you can just factor in maybe harsh words, just family tensions that have happened throughout the year, some misunderstandings perhaps. And, and then you, you become, you hear a lot of people saying, hey, I hope I can just survive the holidays. Uh, I, you know, it's like, we aren't hoping for a Merry Christmas. I mean, come on, we don't want to put the bar that high. We're just hoping for a cordial Christmas. We're just, we're just um, hoping for a Christmas that'll go by and then, you know, no fights will break out, no arguments, you know, um, and, and that's the goal for many people, you know. We're not going to say anything rude, you know, it's like we're just going to keep it to ourselves. Nobody say anything rude. Hopefully they won't say anything rude to us. We, you know, we'll, we'll mind ourselves. We'll just, you know, be, be on our best behavior. Then when we get in the car and we're driving away, then the insults can fly, right? <laughs> because we're in the safety of our home. Uh, there's also... And I'm, this is just to, to have a little fun. Um, we also have in every family what I call the psycho factor. Now, um, I think this is biblical. I think it's somewhere in the Old Testament. I don't know. But, but it seems like every family has one, you know, kind of peculiar, odd, embarrassing, strange person in their family. And um, I didn't think we had one. <laughs> and then I found out it's me. So... Um, <laughs> But, 
But some of you know what I'm talking about. You've got that, you know, you've got that family member. It's just like, oh boy, what's he going to say? What's she going to say? What are they going to do? You know, what, how are they going to embarrass me or whatever? And, uh, and there's typically one in every family. And again, if you don't think you have one, it's probably you. But anyway, <laughs> but all that to say, we're, we're going to come into a situation and some opportunities. I'm looking at this as opportunities to extend that greatest gift of forgiving we're going to look at a, a guy by the name of Joseph. And you guys are going, oh, I know Joseph. That's the one that was with Mary. That's true. But we're not going to look at that Joseph. We're going to talk about a guy named Joseph who was a young guy in the Old Testament. He had great visions. He had great dreams from God. He was just a very special person from God. His dad also gave him a very colorful coat. And that added some tension to the family too. Um, and when God would reveal dreams to him, visions to him, I don't know, it, it, the Bible doesn't really specify whether it was immaturity, whether it was, I don't think it was pride. I think he just was so excited that God was telling him stuff. And, and, and so, you know, he's telling his brothers, God's going to do this in my life and God's doing that. And here's this vision. And, and his brothers got increasingly jealous. And, uh, and, you know, you're such an arrogant punk. You, little, you think you're better than the rest of us. You're always, oh, God told me this. God gave me that. And the dad gives you this special coat, the whole thing. So finally, his brothers decide to kill him. Um, they decide they're going to kill him and they're going to throw him in a well and tell their dad that an animal killed him. But Joseph had a brother named Reuben who liked him more than the other brothers. And he wanted to save Joseph. And he said, hey, let's not kill him. Um, we can put him in a well without hurting him. We don't need to kill him and throw him in there. You know, so Reuben's plan was just kind of like fingers crossed. Maybe throw him in there and somehow he can get rescued or get out somehow. Uh, but he wanted to save, you know, save Joseph and then send, send him back to his dad. Just say, hey, get away from us so that we, you know, this doesn't get any more tense. But when Joseph came to his brothers, they attacked him. They tore off his beautiful coat and they threw him in a pit. And they basically said, die there, you know. And, that, and that, then his brother Judah got an idea. He goes, wait a minute. It's not helping us any just have him sit in a hole. Let's sell him. Let's not kill him. Let's sell him into slavery. And we can make some money. And, you know, and then he's out of our hair forever. We got some cash. He's out of our hair. It's perfect. And that's what they did. And scripture says that even in slavery, Joseph was righteous and received favor until he was betrayed by Potiphar's wife who lied. And he was falsely accused. He was thrown into prison and and, and here we see a man's life, a man who feared God, hadn't done anything significantly wrong. Start to see a downward spiral of years, years of pain caused by the hands of his own family members. Even though his life was outwardly spiraling, uh, God was still inwardly using him and working in him, even in, as he was in prison, doing a, a powerful work. And God was taking him and positioning him in just the right place at the right time and by the right people to surprisingly elevate him to where he would become the second ruler, the second position in all of Egypt. Well, years pass. And one day, Joseph found himself face to face with his brother. There's a famine and so forth. His brothers come to Egypt because Joseph had strategically planned out how to save, uh, you know, crops so that they could, you know, uh, be provided for. And they let the rest of the area know and their, you know, Joseph's brothers came. But in Genesis 45, we see a snapshot of the pain Joseph lived with. And maybe some of you can relate to this kind of pain as well. In Genesis chapter 45, verse 1, it says this. Then Joseph could no longer control himself before all his attendants. Have you ever been so overcome with emotion that you literally could not control your emotions? You, you just, you couldn't do this. I've seen people stand up at, at memorial services, funeral services, and just couldn't contain themselves. You're just overcome with emotion. And that's what happened to, to, uh, to, to Joseph here. It says, and he cried out, have everyone leave my presence. So there was no one with Joseph when he made himself known to his brothers. And look at this. It says, he wept so loudly that the Egyptians heard him and Pharaoh's household heard him. So he's locked away, isn't it? But they could hear him way out there. You know, he, he just wept so loud. He, he finally gets enough composure to ask. And he says, Joseph said to his brothers in verse 3, he says to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still living? See, they didn't have email, no cell phones. They, he, had, he had no idea. Um, 
But look, his brothers were in such shock. His brothers were not able to answer him because they were terrified at his presence. Here he is. They've thrown him. The last that they knew of him, he was in a pit and was dead. And now they're looking at the guy who ranked second in all of Egypt. And they've come to ask a favor of him. Joseph is a guy behind closed doors losing it. Years, years of questions and pain and regret and hurt and all of that just pouring out. Um, and, and I've said this before and you've probably said this too, but isn't it amazing how those we love the most often hurt us the most, the most deeply? Um, some of you, if, if you were to deal face to face with some family issues, the fact is that maybe you have a broken relationship with a parent, with a, with a father, with a mother, with a sibling or a child. Uh, many of us, if we dealt face to face with some of the real family issues, um, we'd start and we could do nothing but just break down and weep. Just like Joseph did. But see, sadly, it's, a easy, it's easy to slip into a cycle of continually letting that hurt keep going. Um, someone said, has rightfully said, hurt people, hurt people. And I believe that. And I've seen that. Um, I remember my brother and I, when we were kids, um, we would wrestle around. And um, the rule was you just kept wrestling until, you know, one of you got hurt or both of you got hurt, you know. And, um, and so then we'd be yelling and whatever. You started it and you did this and we'd cry and yell. And my mom would come in and she'd, you know, break it up and, you know, and maybe discipline us, you know, or whatever. And um, then a couple of minutes later, we'd be back at it again, just wrestling around. And I mean, that's how some families are. It, it seems like, and I mean, in a more intense and not so fun way. There's a little jab here, a little hurt here, a little insult here, a little rejection, a little bit of pain. Then, and then the holidays can be a breeding ground for doing it again. So what do we want to do when we've been hurt, when we've been betrayed? What is it that we do? We're going we're gonna to talk about some biblical choices that we have. Um, and these are not feelings. The, these are choices, not feelings. When someone hurts you, chances are you're not going to wake up one day and go, man, I've been abused and I've been mistreated and I just feel like loving today. That's probably not going to be the case. You'll probably wake up saying, I'd like to rip someone's face off. You know, it's more like that. But we're not going to do that. We're going to take a look and beyond our feelings, we're going to make some choices um, to what we really are to do what, when, when, we're not, when we don't know what to do with this hurt, with this pain. So we're going to look at the, these choices. So number one, when I'm hurt, the first thing to do is something you could do no matter what you feel, choose to pray. You can pray when you're angry, you can pray when you're sad, when you're depressed. You don't even have to pray out loud if your emotions are so deep. We're going to choose to pray, even if we don't feel like it, for those who've hurt us. Who, the greatest example, of course, of that is Jesus. Unquestioningly, it was Jesus who at his birth, at, right? You're just freshly born. Herod sought after Jesus. Why? To worship him? Well, that's what he told the wise men. No, it was to murder him. And Jesus became a man and had barely begun his earthly ministry when people even in his hometown of Galilee decided they, they, were, they got so angry at some of the things that he said and did. Luke 4, 29 tells us that, that they took Jesus to the edge of the hill and they were going to push him off to kill him. And it's miraculously, really, it says he slipped straight through the crowd and got away. All through his life, Jesus was rejected. Jesus, over and over again, Jesus chose 12 and trained 12 men, his disciples. He revealed God's plan to them. He shared his most intimate and painful uh, conversations, his moments with them. And he poured into them. And he just said, I'm going to train you to take my word, to take my mission, to take this good news and to change the world. And of course, we know that one of those who walked with him saw the miracles, was loved by Jesus deeply and turned on Jesus and betrayed him. How? Of all things, with a kiss on the cheek. Judas betrays Jesus. At Jesus' crucifixion, as he hung on the cross, dying for the sins of the world, we, we only read, and it may not be the case, but we only read that there was one of the 12 disciples who even was, showed up right there at the cross. I mean, what a lonely feeling. Pontius Pilate, I, I love this story because of the tension of it. It's like, you ever known someone who you share the, the message of Jesus with and they're so close to accepting it, but then they don't? And Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor of Judea under Emperor T Tiberius, had a conversation with Jesus. It was, it's probably my favorite conversation in the whole Christmas story. But, but he has this conversation with Jesus and, uh, after he's arrested. 
And he calls the charges of that were against Jesus baseless. In fact, he declares, I can't find anything wrong with him. I can't find where he sinned. I, I can't see where he's broken any laws. Yet, Pilate ignored his conscience. He, had, he also ignored some really good advice from his wife. And he chose the political, you know, what was politically expedient at the time, you know, over what was really good, what was right, what was righteous. And he failed to recognize the truth. In fact, he's the one that said to Jesus, what is truth? And, and, and even when truth was standing right in front of him, he condemned an innocent man to die. The crowds turned away from Jesus. They betrayed Jesus. I mean, there was a tradition where you could, they would release one criminal, you know, at the Passover at, at this time of year. And they said, bring us out Barabbas. That was a horrible, terrible criminal. They said, well, what do you want us to do with Jesus? They, he figured, oh, they're going to let Jesus go. No, 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 no. Crucify him. Crucify him. The creation mocked the creator. Soldiers placed a, a, a mocking crown of thorns on his head, beat him almost to death, mercilessly whipping him, you know, whipping flesh off of him and, and drove stakes into his hands and his feet, nailed him to the cross. And as he's hanging there on the cross after being betrayed by mankind, worse yet, by his most intimate, closest friends, what does Jesus do? In the middle of all of this pain, and the spiritual weight of the world that he was taking on him, he prays in Luke 23, 34. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. Jesus prayed. He prayed. When you've been hurt, even though you don't feel like it, pray. That's a, that's a great thing about prayer. You, can do it, you, you don't even have to feel like it to pray. You can just pray. Now, what should we pray? I know what you, you want to pray. God, strike them dead. You know, I, you know some, of those, some of those ones in Psalms, you know. You know, I, yeah, great. Um, but, you know, give them a plague. I don't know. Some, that sounds biblical, right? Yeah, put a plague on their house. Um, or at least hemorrhoids or something, you know, right? You want to, you want to, something. But here's what we pray. What do we pray? Number one, we pray for God to heal their hurt. Say, really? If they're hurting others, chances are they've been hurt. We ask God to do a healing work. And then it's really their responsibility to seek this. But the second thing we can pray is we pray for God to forgive them. That they turn from their sins. That they repent and through Jesus Christ find forgiveness. Pray for them. That they will seek that forgiveness. That God will forgive them. The third thing, and I, this, is, this is very difficult, but it's very biblical. We're going to pray that God blesses them. It's like, come on. I mean, there, there's a, a, a trilogy of, you know, agony right there. You say, I'm going to pray for that, for the people that really should be just begging me to forgive them. Now, here's what we need to realize. When you are praying like that, your prayers may or may not affect them. But I guarantee you, when you pray, I promise you, they will affect you. You cannot pray for someone else without God doing a work in your life. Praying for those who have hurt you. And that's what Jesus said in Luke chapter 6, verse 38, uh, 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 28. Luke 6, 28 says, bless, bless those who curse you. And pray for those who what? Mistreat you. These aren't prayer partners that we're praying for each other. You pray for me, I'll pray for you. No, I'm going to curse you. I'm going to mistreat you. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to respond by praying and blessing you. See, that's that first choice is going to be to choose to pray. Choose to pray. The second choice is going to be even more difficult. But we're going to make the right choice anyway. And that's that we're going to choose to forgive. We're going to choose to forgive. You say, but wait a minute. I, they, they should be seeking my forgiveness. Look, um, we're going to choose to forgive. Why, and why is that important? Uh, Jesus, Jesus addressed this, why it was so important. In Matthew chapter 6, verse 14, look at this. It says, For if you forgive men when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. Now, we'll talk about this in just a moment. Uh, continuing on. It says, but if you 
do not forgive men their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. We talked about this in our series on the Lord's Prayer, because this is a statement that Jesus makes right following that Lord's Prayer. And, and I need to, you know, it's like, this is a pretty sobering verse, if you ask me. Now, what I need to make clear, very, very clear about this passage of Scripture, is this verse does not teach that our eternal destiny is based on our forgiving other people. <laughs> it, okay, that's very important. However, what it does teach and what does make very clear is that our relationship with God will be damaged. The fellowship will be broken if we refuse to forgive those who have offended us. In, in, in Matthew 6, as I mentioned, Jesus was teaching the disciples how to pray. And he outlines how to restore intimacy with God. They could see there was something different. He was just so close to God when he prayed. And they wanted that too. So they, he said, they said, teach us to pray. Jesus teaches how to pray. And Jesus instructs us and them to, to build into our prayers a request for God to forgive us in the same way that we have forgiven others who have harmed us. So Jesus is saying that asking for God's forgiveness for one's own sin, all the while withholding forgiveness from someone else, is not only bizarre, it's, I mean, it's hypocritical. We cannot, and some of you may feel like, why do I feel so far away from God? We cannot possibly walk with God in true fellowship if we refuse, if we're hanging on to bitterness, if we're hanging on to the lack of forgiveness, if we refuse to forgive others. I'll put it this way. Forgiveness is not an elective course in Christianity. <laughs> it is, it's, it's a requirement. And now, if you're, if you're like me, uh, I can first give somebody, you know, once. I mean, if they do something, you know, one time, then I wise up, you know. I'll forgive you this once, but if you do it again, I'm writing you off. That's it. Nope, not coming to your parties, not going to, you know, not going to hang out with you. Nope, that's it. You know, that kind of stuff. Well, Jesus probably knew that this was going to happen. And he had a conversation with Peter, Peter that really highlights this. Uh, as we look at Matthew 18, 20 and 22, Peter comes to Jesus. And you can almost hear the spiritual pride that Peter has, um, in, you know, just kind of in his tone of voice. Because he says, he says, then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother when he sins against me? And then he goes on and he says, you know, you know, it's like, isn't, isn't this impressive? Up to seven times. Now, there was a law that was talked about, you know, one, two, and three times. So he's like, oh, wow, this is how spiritual I am. I'm willing to forgive somebody seven times. In verse 22, it says, Jesus answered, I tell you not seven times, but 77 times. Now, some translations say 70 times seven. The, Greek word actually means 77 times. The point is, was very obvious to Peter and it's very obvious to us. He's saying, there's no number. You keep, whether it's 77 or 490, you keep forgiving. You forgive just, I mean, what, what's God's number? You tell me what God's number is and I'll tell you the number that you can have. See, Jesus wasn't simply raising the number. He was saying, you're offering him unlimited forgiveness just as God's forgiveness is unlimited as well. Um, <clears throat> some of you, and it's not, you don't want to, but some of you are carrying bitterness and hatred and unforgiveness towards someone, and maybe others as well. And, and, may, and you may have a moment, and you're listening to God's word today, and when you know, a light comes on, and you go, uh-oh, God's gently showing me that there's someone I haven't forgiven. So, just, you know, as an application, as a thought, and, and, and you don't have to say it out loud, but here's a question I want you to wrestle with. Who is it in your life that you haven't forgiven? Now, if you got into a squabble with your spouse on the way to church, I'm not, don't elbow them and put right down their name. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about who really, who is it in your life you haven't forgiven? There's a supermarket chain in um, Germany called Penny, um, and they do some incredible advertising. Um, especially around Christmas time. Uh, they go far beyond selling groceries. Uh, and I really love this. I wanted to share this one from a few years ago.
Um, but that takes a choice, and that takes some hard choices. Because we can talk about, oh, yeah, we're going to make a choice. We're going to go ahead and take a risk. But we have to make some choices. I hope we're gonna, going to choose to pray for them. I hope we're going to choose to forgive those that have hurt us. Now, with all that being said, how in the world are we going to forgive? <laughs> you know, when, when, when your feelings tell you to do the exact opposite of forgive. In fact, if your feelings just tell you, just ignore it. Just forget it. You don't, you don't want to forgive and they don't deserve it. So how do you get to a place where you choose to forgive? Here's, here's what, what works for me and, that, and a process I need to go through. Maybe it'll work for you as, as well. I, what I try to do is when I look at how do I forgive, I focus on how God has forgiven me. I focus on how over and over God has forgiven me. And maybe that would help you. Focus on how God has forgiven you. When I start to stack up the list um, of my sin, sin after sin after sin, how I've hurt people, how I've betrayed people, all of a sudden, I see that God has forgiven me such an incredible amount. And it becomes much easier to forgive those who've sinned against me. Here's, here's what the Bible says in Colossians chapter 3, verse 13. It says, bear with each other and forgive whatever grievance you may have against one another. And look at this key right here. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. That's the basis of our forgiveness. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. One of the saddest things um, we see in church it, it, a, a lot is we see, you know, broken marriages and broken relationships where there's unforgiveness. Um, I, I heard about a couple and somebody who told me this story said this is a true story. This is another pastor, but um, heard about a couple. They were struggling in their marriage. Uh, I've done this with a kind of listing things, but they decided, they said, go home, make a box for each of you, cut a slit in the top, one for each of you, and then just put right on there, you know, grievances or fault box, you know. And whenever the other one does something to irritate you, bother you, offend you, whatever, write it down, stick it in the box. And then we're going to bring it, you know, then at the end of the week, we're going to look at this and we're going to talk through it. So they do this all through the week, you know, and so at the end of the week, they get their fault boxes out and they're, they're going to go through them one by one. And um, the wife's so excited. She can, she can hardly wait because there's just, you know, it's packed. She's had to stuff it in there, you know. <clears throat> she pulls one out, you know, she starts reading it, you know, oh, you left the toilet seat up four times and you left your underwear all over the house and you, you were late for coming home for, and you didn't even call me and tell me you were going to be late and, 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 you know, all of these things over and over. She just starts reading all of these over and over. And then after being totally humiliated, he hands his box to her and he goes, well, here's your faults. And she's going, man, this is, this is pretty, pretty full. And she opens up, pulls up the first one right there on top, unfolds it. It says, I forgive you. Puts it down. All of them. No list. Just, I forgive you. Um, she said, that's not fair. You didn't play the game right. No, she was actually very happy about that. I forgive you. I forgive you. The faults. Here's your faults. Uh, we, whatever our box would look like before God, um, it would be, you know, I don't know, I need a couple of refrigerator boxes, I think. And I would pull those out and God would say, forgiven, paid for, on the cross, Jesus rose, say, all of those faults. Those who have tasted the bitterness, for example, of divorce, I mentioned that earlier, or th th you'll be the first ones to tell you, if, if in that pain, you allow that bitterness to keep, you know, just mulling over, um, man, it's, it'll, it'll destroy you. I've had people tell me, I literally had somebody tell me, uh, oh, it's been just, it's just right after COVID. Somebody went through a divorce during COVID. And the wife said, I wish he had killed me. What? She goes, that would be easier. It would have been easier if he had just killed me. Thinking, oh, the pain. We want Hillside Church to be a place where people whose lives have been crushed by whatever, not just divorce, but whatever, don't have to hide and we can come and we can find healing. But there are those of us, I mentioned the divorce, are those of us who are married who are carrying around unforgiveness. And maybe you've got a very cordial marriage where, you know, we just kind of agreed to be nice to each other for the kids' sake, so and whatever. But in your heart, there's no commitment. There's no love there. Imagine what would happen if people who call themselves followers of Christ 
started acting like it. I can only imagine if people who call themselves Christian, you know, Christian marriages started adopting and practice this principle of God in their marriage. It would, it would revolutionize our lives. What would happen? You're not going to feel like it all the time. If people hurt you, it's planted deep, but we can make a choice. See, we could choose to pray. We can choose to forgive. And the third thing, and this is going to sound crazy, especially if you don't know Christ yet, is that we choose to bless. We choose to bless. We bless those who've hurt us. We already read a scripture that, where Jesus said that. Look what the Bible says. Paul said this to the Roman church. He said this. This is pretty amazing. Uh, Romans 12, verse 19. He says, do not take revenge, my friends. And in the situation, they, they had every, with seemingly every right to you know, exercise revenge. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. Not if a hungry person's hungry. If your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Look what Jesus said, uh, Luke chapter 6, verse, verse 27. But he says, but I tell you, hear me, love your enemies. You talk about something kind of counterintuitive. Love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. What do we do? We bless. See, we're making a choice. We're choosing to pray. We're choosing to forgive. We're choosing to bless. Now, inevitably, as I talk to you and talk through some of these very painful issues, there are people who will say, well, hey, that's easy for you to say, you know, David, because you're just in your, you know, you're a pastor and you live in your little bubble and don't face pain. Listen, um, I live in the same sin-filled world that you live in, and, um, and I face the same kind of stuff. I have faced some intense pain. The most difficult things in my life I've experienced, I would, I would uh, fall apart like Joseph did. If I tried, there are some, there's some hurts in my life that if I were to try to just tell you them, just tell you like a story, I would not be able to get through it. Um, and they hurt, it hurts deeply. And I'd also argue that it's easier to forgive someone that hurts me than it is when you hurt somebody that I love. So, um, I, I, I find it much easier to forgive people who hurt me directly than if they were to, you know, hurt my wife. That's not good. And then if they were to hurt my kids, right? Uh, some of you have had that experience. And some of you sometimes have said, man, I wish it just happened to me. I remember my kids getting sick thinking, I wish, just, I, I, wish I got sick instead of them. But then somebody mistreats them and you think, wow. So the most painful situations in life are painful things, I think, that are done to our family. Um, I, I love ministry, but I also got to tell you that, um, that people in the past, and fortunately in the very distant past, that I've been called to minister to have been really cruel and malicious. Uh, I wish I could stand before you and say, I have never hated anyone. I wish I could tell you that, but uh, with integrity, I can't say that it would be a lie. I, I've hate, I had a, this is many years ago, but I had a, a window of time where I hated someone that was attacking me so viciously, I thought I was going to have to leave ministry. Because it was just, they were so hateful, but I just answered hatred with hatred. And, um, and it was really, really dark. Now, I could stand before you today with an absolutely clear conscience to tell you, I do not hate a single person on this planet. Um, somehow, in the middle of my hatred and all that was going on in my heart, I realized I needed to work toward forgiveness. I needed to give it over to God. And um, I started praying. And I didn't feel a thing. Didn't feel any better at all. But over time, as you commit, I got to the point where I knew it was time to forgive and made that choice. I wonder what's on the other side of forgiveness for your life. I wonder what's on the other side of forgiveness for your family. Let me encourage you, deal with it face to face. I mean, right, some of those people are coming. And you say, oh, I can just tolerate it for a couple of days. What if you were to resolve that tension? You said, yeah, but it's your fault. You know, it's not your fault, it's, it's their fault. What if you were to still be that, love your enemies, <laughs> you say, but I'm related to them. Yeah, well, sometimes, right? You, you got to do it. Deal with them and, 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 and cry it out. You know, if before they come, you just got to get with God and, you know, munch some carpet and cry. Just do it. You know, let it go. It's okay. Mourn those lost years. 
That's what, that's what they are. They're lost. But grab the moment that you know that God can bring healing from this point on. So what's on the other side of forgiveness? Um, what's on the other side of forgiveness for Joseph? What was on the other side of forgiveness for him? Do you know what was on the other side? On the other side of forgiveness for him was the birthing of an entire nation. The entire nation of Israel was born at that moment, in a sense, in that moment of forgiveness. The lineage of Christ poured through an act of forgiveness. So what does God have for your situation on the other side of forgiveness? Look at, look at what happened to Joseph. This is very powerful, powerful, powerful ending to one story and the beginning for another. In, in uh, Continuing Genesis 45, excuse me, on verse 8 first. So then it was not you, he says to his brothers, who sent me here, but God. He made me father to Pharaoh, Lord of his entire household and ruler of all Egypt. He's saying, as wicked as what they did, God used you. This was God. God used you to throw me in a pit so that I could get to this position right here. Then verse 14, then he threw his arms around his brother Benjamin and wept. And Benjamin embraced him weeping. And he kissed all his brothers and wept over them. Afterward, his brothers talked with him. They finally got it together and uh, were able to talk. I mean, this was huge. Um, I, I have to say, I've been mistreated. I've never been thrown in a pit, left to die. <laughs> um, I've been in the pits sometimes, but that's a whole different thing, right? Some of you have experienced that. For Joseph, what's on the other side of forgiveness? For, on the, uh, really, on the other side of his forgiveness was a miracle. And I pray that might be true of you as well. Because I, I, I can guarantee you, some of you are saying, well, what's the use? Let's just let bygones be bygones. Let's just let this pass. Let's just get through, you know, the holiday and then we'll be fine. But our gift of forgiveness might not need to be, you know, this big, intense, dramatic thing, you know, like we read about in Joseph. It might just be some tensions there. Some, you know, it might not be this big serious offense is what I'm saying. It might be something, you know, maybe you just ignored someone avoided someone, left someone out, turned some kind of a cold shoulder to, to someone, or judged someone because of a false view on, on your part or something. Um, as we celebrate the birth of Christ and express our gratitude for his life and atonement, I want to encourage us, let's be doers of the word, not just hearers, by extending forgiveness to others as he has to us. How can we celebrate that free gift he has given to us and yet withhold it from another? God's greatest gift this Christmas, your love, your forgiveness. I hope that you'll make this Christmas and each Christmas to come a, a time of reconciliation, a time to forgive. Let's bow. <clears throat> God came in the flesh. Jesus Christ, God's son, came to reconcile us to God. We were actually enemies with God. We were separated from him, but Jesus came to restore that relationship. We've been talking about restoring human relationships and even specifically family relationships. God is our heavenly father and he wants us to be in his family. But maybe you might be here and you say, I don't know for certain that I know that. Let me just say, if you have received the grace and love and forgiveness of God, your capacity for loving and forgiving others is exponentially, eternally more vast. You have something from God that you can pass along. No, it's not just willpower. And if you've never asked Christ into your life, I want to invite you right now to do that. Um, you might say, you know, I'm just not sure. Maybe you say, well, I prayed a prayer one time, but I'm not really sure I meant it. And there's no magical prayer. You don't recite something or go through a ritual. It's a step of faith where you make that commitment to God, where you say, I'm turning from my own way. I'm not going to rely on my own good deeds or whatever I might be relying on. I am going to rely on you. And if you'd like to pray and ask Christ to be your Savior, I'm, I'm just going to suggest that we pray a prayer that I've, um, that I, similar to what I prayed when I accepted Christ. But you can pray. This is your time to make a decision. But if this helps, just follow along as I pray this aloud. Just pray it in your heart or you can even pray it out loud if you'd like. Just say, Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for sending your son Jesus to earth to pay for the forgiveness of my sin. 
I believe Jesus died, was buried, and rose again for me. I accept your gift of salvation and ask you to make me your child. I give you my life today. I want to follow you and serve you from this point on. Help me to forgive others because you have forgiven me so much. Thank you for your gift of eternal life and for making me a part of your family. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Lord, we are so grateful for your love, for your forgiveness, for the mercy that you gave and the grace you've extended. We celebrate that today and every day. And we're so thankful that we can be a part of your family. We, our sins are not forgiven because of anything we've done. We aren't, a, aren't one of your children because we behaved ourselves or went through some ritual. We simply trusted you in faith. And so we thank you today that we can do that. And we pray that as we get opportunities, whether it be in our times of holiday celebration or even beyond, maybe it's at work or in our neighborhoods or school, to extend that love and grace to people that have hurt us, that have ridiculed us, people that maybe have abused us and damaged us. If we could just extend that word of blessing and that forgiveness and show them your love, Father, we would be so grateful. Use us, we pray, and we thank you for this time we've had to worship you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much again for joining me today. And if there's any way we can be of help or encouragement to you, please feel free to reach out. Again, I know this can be a tough time of the year. It's a wonderful time of the year, but also hard. And I want you to know that we are here for you. We'd be glad to pray for you or be of any encouragement we can. You can email me or a wonderful way to contact us is to go to hillside.church and there's a couple of forms you could fill out. If you have a request, if you have a question you want to pose to us that we can help answer, uh, maybe you have just a prayer request. We have forms on hillside.church that you could fill out and they go to, if it's a prayer request, our prayer team. And if it's a question to the right person, um, usually if something, you know, Bible related, it comes to me. But I want to be of help in any way I can. Again, thank you so much for joining me. I hope that you're enjoying the Christmas season. Don't miss the true meaning of it. I hope it's a blessing to you. And I'll look forward to seeing you again next week. Take care and God bless.